Well, hello and welcome to Time in the Word at RHCC. Uh, one of the things that I just want to acknowledge at the get-go of this time is the fact that uh, something new kind of that we're doing at Richmond Hill Community Church is neighborhood churches. And so right now, there are four neighborhood churches that are gathered together in homes and are joining us. And so that is really, really exciting. So if you're in a neighborhood church, we just want you to uh, let us know where you are and uh, let us know that you're watching and joining in together as we spend some time in the Word. And maybe that's an idea for you if you're living in other places and not in Richmond Hill where we're based. Uh, maybe you can start your own neighborhood church where you are and just invite people into your home to have some authentic time uh, with the Word and also with people. And we're going to be posting a resource a little bit later uh, that you can share with those in your home that can help you to go a bit deeper with the Word. So there's something really, really good about listening to God's Word and listening to thoughts but then applying it at a deeper level to your own heart and to your own spiritual life. Often that's where we learn the best and where we learn the most is learning from each other. So we would just encourage you to do that. If you don't live in Richmond Hill, then do your own neighborhood church. If you do live in Richmond Hill, contact us and we will help connect you with one of our neighborhood churches that are in different neighborhoods around the area. So good morning, our neighborhood churches. It is really, really good to have you with us. So we are spending time in the Word together, unfolding Ephesians. And we've been doing that for the last couple of weeks. We've been asking these questions. Who were you before you encountered God? Who are you now after his story has connected in with your story? And, and what is a word that describes your journey. Now think about that for a minute. And if you wanna just put it down in the chat, then that would be great. If you're on Facebook, you can just type it in there. What is a word that would describe your journey? Mm, that's an interesting thing, you know? And then I guess we're asking the broader question of who are we as a church together? What does that mean for us? identity. Who are we? Our personal story, our story together. This is us. Well, this four-week series reminds us that our identity is found in Christ. And instead of attempting to earn God's approval or focusing on our imperfections, who does that? Hands up. I know I do. We can rest in the work of Jesus and find freedom to live as our truest selves. And when we understand our story through the lens of his story, we naturally view ourselves and others differently. And I love that thought. And I'm so, I'm going to say it again for you because I think it's really important. And this is a phrase maybe that you can write down because it's the crux of what we're doing here together in these last few weeks. When we understand our story through his his story, we naturally view ourselves and others differently. Scripture shows, shows us who we are and who we were meant to be. And so we're learning together who we are in Christ and whose we are in Christ. Connected with this series, we're hearing the stories of, of people in our congregation. In this past week, we heard from Atti. Oh, such such an amazing story. But the word that she used to describe her journey is I am loved. So, so finish that sentence. I am, and then what's the word that you want to use? These are the things that we want you to type in the chat so you can think about that and share together. So here we go. You know, we've been three weeks. This is our fourth week, which means that we are at the tail end of the sermon series. This is the last sermon that you're going to hear in this particular series that we've been focused on together. So three weeks ago, Tim helped us rediscover together our true identity, right? And it's found in Christ. And 
when we know him better, we know ourselves better. So that was where we started. And then two weeks ago, we were reminded that we are part of this identity in such a way that we are accepted. We are sons and daughters of Christ. And we have an inheritance because we are chosen. And I must admit that that particular uh, sermon was so, so close to my heart. The fact that I am chosen and you are chosen. And so last week, uh, Tim spoke about God's love, God's great love for us. And we were reminded of the fact that this love does not make us better than other people. It makes us better for other people. So I hope you heard that, right? God's great love doesn't make us better than other people. It makes us better for other people. And so we established that knowing what Christ has done for us means we can begin to view others with the same heart of Jesus, the same heart as Jesus. So that's been our journey. So if you're just catching up, that's what it is in a nutshell of where we're at. And uh, so this, this is the first time kind of you're picking up with us. That's okay. Uh, hopefully that's brought you up to speed, but also remember you can go back and on our YouTube channel, we actually have the sermons, just the sermons listed there. And so you're welcome to go back there and get caught up with things. So we're having another look at Ephesians 2, and we're going to explore this a little more together. And so as I began to prepare my message for today, I remembered something that was actually shared in our neighborhood church last Sunday. All right. And this is the gift of neighborhood churches, right? We sit around and we share some of our thoughts together and we talk through some great questions. Well, there was something that was shared at our neighborhood church last week. And, and it was one of those things that, that stood out to Tom. We love Tom. Tom comes and attends our neighborhood church. And he pointed out this, and I love this. We know who we are. We are God's workmanship. We are his masterpiece. Thanks, Tom. Uh, you probably should have been here preaching this sermon today because that's exactly where we're going today as we look at this portion of scripture. As we close out This Is Us, uh, we're going to focus in on that Ephesians 2 and I'm going to actually zero in on a particular verse today uh, that's going to help us. So I'm going to invite you to turn to your Bibles, Ephesians 2. And here's something I was reminded of last Sunday. Uh, our people were frantically looking for that portion of scripture in their Bible and they wanted to pause. So we're just going to take a breath together as you look up Ephesians 2 in your Bible. And uh, so look that up. And if you don't have a physical Bible that's with you, Bible Gateway is always a good way, good way to kind of look up the God scriptures. So have a look at BibleGateway.com and you can search up Ephesians 2. And we're beginning at that verse 1 that we're going to start reading together. So hopefully my banter has given you enough time to look that up. So here we go. And I'm going to read from God's word. Are we ready? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desire of the body of the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So that is who we were. Now listen to who we are. But God, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him 
and seated us with him in the heavenly heavenly places of Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. (laughs) And this is not your own doing. Let's be clear. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Do you hear that word? Tom, do you hear that word? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk, that we should walk in them. What a portion of scripture. You want to hear about the before and the after. That is a great portion to have a look at and to read through. So together today, we're going to zero in on verse 10. Easy, right? Not a big portion of scripture. I mean, we've read the big portion, but we're zeroing together on verse 10. And so this is where we're going to find what Paul is really, really wanting to say to the the church of the Ephesians. And so here we go. By these words, Paul gives the Ephesians the reason salvation is not from man or by things that they do. Do you hear that? Really important. Rather, salvation is being made into a masterpiece. It's not something that they have produced. As regenerated believers, they were a masterpiece that God had produced. And so there's a massive difference here. Now we're going to talk a little Greek and I'm not super well versed in the Greek, but we're going to talk about it because it's really, really important as we understand this portion of scripture. So the word workmanship here comes from the Greek Greek word poema, from which we get the word poem. Did you hear that in that pronunciation? Poem meaning a work of art a masterpiece. And the Jerusalem Bible actually translates it as works of art. As a master worker, God had created them in Christ Jesus. And the word translated created here comes from the Greek word kitzo, and it describes only God's activity, all right? And denotes something that only he alone can produce. Have you you put that together yet? Works of art that only he alone can produce. It was critically important for the Ephesian church to understand that good works were not the roots from which their salvation would grow. But it was the fruit that God intended it to bear. God has not saved them because of their works, but he has saved them to do good works. Do you hear that? That is an important part of theology. So, so, so let's talk about what that really means then as we apply it into our own hearts and into our own lives. And, and as we continue to consider our identity and what it means, the fact is that when we know who we are, when we can walk freely in the good works that God created for us, we recognize that that actually is exactly what we are made for. As you and I live out our faith from day to day, which is what we strive to do every day, God has prepared this path of good works that he works through us. So, as you live that out. And sometimes we misunderstand the thinking that is there, right? Just think about that for a minute. Sometimes we misunderstand thinking that this means a work for God. Instead, it is actually God performing his work in and through us, right? Do you hear that? We're not working for God, okay? God is performing his work 
in and through us. And thankfully, we do not need to keep trying to earn our place, to earn our place in God's heart. Our identity in Christ is already sealed because we've talked about that. We're chosen. And so our identity is sealed. Now though, now we live in loving obedience to his call as we strive to faithfully reflect his image of love to the people around us. And, and, and I'm just going to suggest that you think of it this way. As we consider that we are chosen and that we are loved, these realities lead to the fact that we are chosen to love. We are chosen to love. I am personally thankful <laughs> that the love of God is a transforming love. And many of us can testify to that. Those of us who have been living this faith for a while, we can testify to that transforming love. And it meets me and it meets you right where you are. But when I receive this love, it always takes me where I should be going. And so the love of God that saved my soul has also changed my life and it can change yours too. And as believers who are chosen to love, we share a common thread of being in Christ. But this does not mean that we are carbon copies of each other. Thank the Lord for that. We are varied in ages, in backgrounds, in cultures, in experiences, in abilities. God has skilled and diversed us in different ways and in groups of people to glorify himself through our generations, through our cultures, and through our communities. And so we should not shy away from our uniqueness, but instead fully embrace it. Truly embracing our identity in Christ helps us understand that God will continue to transform our hearts into the likeness of Jesus, to reflect Jesus. And, and Jesus taught that the greatest two commandments were, what? Can you put them in the chat faster than I can say them? I'll give you a minute. What were the greatest two commandments? Are you ready for it? To love God and to love each other. So as we embrace our identity and allow God to work, how could our actions not be affected by this? How could our interactions with people not be affected by this? Whatever our circumstances, God will work through us to accomplish his purpose. German theologian, Martin Luther, once penned these words, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Such a good line. In an article from Christianity Today titled The Sunday to, Morn to Monday Gap, sorry, The Sunday to Monday Gap, a Michigan pastor said this, God actually created you to do good. Who does your good work for you? Because of grace, you are freed from doing your works as some sort of merit system that earns you favor with God. And because of grace, you are even freed from using your words as some sort of system that helps you feel better about yourself. Instead, you simply love your neighbor because they need it, not because they are a means to an end. The good work of God actually frees you to fulfill your calling as you love your neighbor in ordinary ways, in your own workplaces, in your families, and in your neighborhoods. Okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> and this is what our journey through this sermon series is leading us to. It's the crux. This is where the rubber hits the road and when we bring big understanding to our identity in Christ. When we understand our identity, friends, we live it out. We live it out. Now look, I've been pulled into a world 
that I wasn't expecting to be pulled into as a mother. But it appears the majority of my household are Star Wars fans. Now, are there any Star Wars fans out there? I'm sure. Just kind of let me know. Yes, 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 I am, I am. I probably would not be drawn into that if I wasn't forced to sit down with family and to watch these movies. But there's, there's an interesting connect here that I want to I wanna just kind of share with you. In Star Wars, in the stories, the Jedi serve the galaxy as protectors and as peacemakers. They, they couldn't help but walk in their identity. It was, it was who they were, their identity as a Jedi. So in the sequel tr trilogy, Luke tried to hide from his calling. Leia seemed somewhat relaxed in her calling. And Rey was confused and struggled to embrace it. Yet, yet none of them were able to deny that they had the heart of a Jedi and it compelled them to sacrifice for their fellow citizens. Here's the connection point. In a similar way, we cannot deny that we have the heart of a child of God, and it should compel us to love others as Jesus first loved us. I'm not sure if I've ever viewed Star Wars in a biblical way before, <laughs> but it's a pretty powerful connection there. I am so pleased that the most familiar verse in scripture talks about love. You're probably thinking about it even before I say it. And so, you know, I'm talking about John 3:16. and wherever you are, if you're with people, I want you to say it with me if you have it memorized. So here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. By no coincidence, I'm convinced, 1 John 3.16 also speaks about love. And it says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Now we are at the simplicity of the gospel here as we consider this together. And as we know God and know ourselves, we are compelled, we are compelled to understand that love and to share it with others. It's the crux of the gospel. And it needs to become the crux of who we are as we live as a church in our world. A few weeks ago, I mentioned the concept of the Imago Dei. You know, in Genesis, it says that we were made in God's image. This is our identity. <laughs> we were made in God's image. It's called the Imago Dei. And if we understand that at the deepest part of who we are, if we recognize that as our true identity, that we were made in the image of God, that we were loved and that we were chosen by him. Our identity is in Christ. If that's true for me, then it's also true for you. And not only is it true for you, it is true for my family. It is true for my brothers and sisters in whom I know well. It is true for the person that has caused us hurt. It is true for the one that has irritated us to no end. It is true for the one that has mistreated us. 
It is true for the person that we don't agree with. They were made in the image of God, just as I am made in the image of God and as you are. And so really, that changes everything. It should change the world in which we live. It should change every conversation that we have. And it should change the way in which we react and respond to the people around us, to the strangers and to the ones that we know well. We are chosen to love. And this is where we need to end up as we consider the fact that this is us. This is who we are. We are chosen to love. Well, as we consider that at a deeper level today, I'm just going to invite you to pray with me as we internalize that and as we bring God into our own personal space. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, in a world where our identity can be found in so many different places and in a world where we're often told who we are and who we need to be and who we need to become, I am so grateful that we find truth in your word, that we can take what Paul wrote to the Ephesians and we can apply it to our own personal lives. God, we want to be found in you. We want to recognize deep within us, deep within us, that we were made in your image. And as we understand that, may it change the way that we interact with others. God, I pray that if there's anybody listening or watching this today who does not have a personal relationship with you, who are seeking that identity piece, I pray, Lord God, that you would draw them close, that you would speak into their hearts, and that they would accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, for those of us who are on the journey of faith with you, I pray that you would reignite within our spirits what it means, what it means to be made in your image, to be chosen and loved by you, and how that changes the way that we interact with people in our sphere of influence and also people who are strangers. Compel us, Lord God, this week to put this into practice, and, and you're probably putting someone in our minds right now that we need to change the way that we're interacting with because we are called to do and be so much more than we have been. God, we confess, we confess we don't always treat each other in the way that we should. And as a people, we want to do better in our communities, in our worlds, and in our neighborhoods. So Lord God, bring us to a deeper place with you. I pray all this in your precious name. Amen.